tonight, I want to walk you back in time. I want to walk you back 2,000 years to the night in which Jesus sat down with his disciples around a table that you and I today call the communion table. It was a very special time that was unlike any other time because it was a special Passover celebration. But this table and this scene did not actually start at Passover that night. Actually, it started even another thousand or so years back. If you go all the way back to the prophet Daniel chapter 9... Daniel the prophet, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, began to write and prophesy that the Messiah would come. And what's so amazing about his prophecy that defies all mathematical probability is that he prophesies not only that the Messiah would go to Jerusalem to die, but he prophesied the very day that he would walk in. That prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 actually happened thousands of years later on the night in which we sat here. It was the day that Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. Something that we as theologians and Bible teachers call the triumphal entry. Now, most people think that Jesus was probably pretty excited that day that he rode into Jerusalem. But you need to know this, not long before that, he stood upon that same mountain, the Mount of Olives, and he wept over Jerusalem. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. Jesus knew that with that day that he rode that donkey off the Mount of Olives down into Jerusalem, into the heart of the city, he knew that day he was not riding to his coronation. He was riding to his death. And as he was riding, people were laying palm branches and singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But beloved, they did not understand what they were doing. They thought they were hailing the one who was coming to deliver them from the Romans. They thought they were hailing another king, earthly king, and one day he would be that. What they did not comprehend 2,000 years ago when Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem that he was coming not as a conquering king this time but that he was coming as a suffering servant. They had no comprehension of what was about to happen. Days before this, Jesus even tried to warn his disciples of what was coming. For he said to them different things about the cross and the suffering of the Son of Man. And everyone from Peter on down said, you know, we'll never let that happen. We got your back, Jesus. They did not know that the 33 years that this Nazarene walked the planet, the culmination of his purpose was about to be fulfilled just a few days later. They had no understanding that Jesus was on his way to the cross. To suffer the greatest torture a human being could ever encounter. Now he didn't have to do it. You do understand that this was God in the flesh. He wasn't just man. He wasn't just the son of man. He was the son of God. He could.
could have at any moment lifted his voice and called for 10,000 angels and they would have beckoned his call and come and delivered him and destroyed the whole Roman Empire and every hater of his name. But from the moment that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in eternity past looked down through time that did not yet exist, he saw this day as he was riding in and he knew that he was born to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the whole world. This was his moment. And they did not know it. But it was their moment as well. Think about the irony of what I'm going to share with you now. Here comes the temple of God in flesh. Getting off a donkey and walking into the temple of stone. And there... He overturns money changers. He runs out the religious out of his house. What he sees in his house so disgusts him. He says, my house is not supposed to be a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. After he cleanses the temple, he then tells his disciples... Go find me a place to celebrate the Passover. Now in the Western church, we don't know very much about this table because we have done what all religious things do. We have diminished something sacred into a sacrament. The communion that we receive today is but just a sacrament. It's only a picture of what really happened this night. I want you to realize that the same afternoon that they were preparing this table for the Lamb of God, the sheep who had been raised for temple slaughter were being led to the temple itself to be killed for the sins of the people. That night on Passover, he desired earnestly to eat one more meal with his men. And what's crazy is not even they comprehended what was going to take place. This night, we celebrating Palm Sunday today, but I want you to realize just two days after Palm Sunday was a high holy Sabbath, and Jesus made his way to this table. They had no idea that the bread that he was about to break would represent his body that in just a few short days later would be broken for them. They could not comprehend that the cups that they were about to drink of That's real props up there. They had no idea the cup that they were about to drink of wasn't just wine or juice. It represented His blood that was going to be shed for the sins of the whole world. This was a holy moment. So tonight what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to walk you back 2,000 years to this holy night that actually happens this week that focuses on the suffering of our Lord. I want you to bow your heads with me all over this room, and I want us to ask God to speak to us the next few minutes. Father, 
in the next few minutes as we do our best to portray what you did on this holy night. I pray, Lord, that you would, by your Spirit, speak to every person in this room. Change us tonight. Let us see you for who you really are. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. In ages past, and at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. The events that would take place in the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago would change everything for mankind. The words of the patriarch David, the prophet king, would resonate this faithful night during the feast of the Passover as Christ prepared himself and his disciples for what would soon take place. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. This Passover would be like no other in human history as the Son of God reveals to his friends and disciples the mystery of the ages. The next climactic moments would mark for eternity those who would be present as the Son of God stepped into his destiny. The heavens would stand in awe as Jesus fulfilled the words of the prophets. No doubt the words of John were echoing in his mind as he instructed Peter and John to go and prepare for the Passover. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In this moment, not only would the Son of God face a horror beyond human comprehension, he saw his friends and brethren at this table, and he saw what they would face in the very near future. He knew this was the moment he must instill within them a courage that would echo to a thousand generations. The atmosphere in Jerusalem was charged that night and full of wonder as the hordes of hell boasted in arrogance as Satan enters Judas Iscariot. And as the hearts of those who turned against the Son of Man, his friend became his enemy. At the same time, Religious arrogance and indignation possessed the very leaders of the temple as they plotted to destroy the Son of God and his influence and mission. But little did they know this Passover would mark the beginning of a new exodus as the Messiah himself would pour the cup and break the bread. 
a new covenant would be struck between God and man. The second Adam would soon free humanity from the very power of sin and death. The heavens stood at attention, waiting to intervene at any moment. But for the joy that was set before him, Jesus would not call them forth. His mission must run its course. What would take place at this table would prepare those present to change the world. As recorded in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus instructed Peter and John to go before him and the other disciples to prepare for the Passover. They could have never imagined what would unfold that night in the city of David, nor could they have grasped the impact on human history each of them would have because of these events. Jesus trusted these men with his life and would make a solemn oath to not drink of the cup of the vine till he could do so with them in his kingdom. Peter turns to John and says, Did you see the people's faces when they saw Lazarus sitting with Jesus, eating and alive? John grabbed Peter and said, Oh, yes, the Pharisees and the temple priests were astonished and perplexed. But Peter, I heard their mumbling. They wanted to kill both Lazarus and Jesus because so many people have turned to believe that he's the one. Knowing Peter's personality, he said, They fear the people, John. After all, they were eating with a dead man. Ah, Peter laughs. And when they saw the multitude throwing down their cloaks in the palm branches, as Jesus entered the city riding a colt, they were murmuring as the high priest said, this Jesus is trying to trick the people in thinking he was fulfilling prophecy. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt. Peter, John said, when they heard the people proclaim him king and the children crying out Hosanna and worshiping him, the temple elders were so outraged. Peter laughed again ha, and says, when Jesus grabbed that rod and flipped the money changers' tables in the temple, they lost their minds. They dare not threaten him. Quit worrying, John. As Peter and John sought for the man that Jesus had told them to find carrying the water vessel, who would lead them to the house where they would celebrate Passover, John says to Peter again, The words that the Master has been speaking and his countenance have become very intense. And he keeps saying his hour has come. And when he prays, and especially these words, Peter. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Peter, I could feel such a deep presence of God as I did when we were on the mountain. I could hardly bear the weight of the moment as I heard him speak. John is remembering the words of Jesus. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. 
Peter turned to John and said, I know, John. I, too, heard the thunderous sound after Jesus spoke those words. It was like the heavens opened, for they heard the voice of the Father after Jesus cried out, Father, glorify thy name. Both men and the others heard the voice speak from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Peter and John were recalling Jesus' words as he turned to them and to the others and said, This voice has not come for my sake. It has come for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. The Apostle John would write later in his gospel, Jesus made these statements to them to tell them what kind of death he was about to face. Now as the disciples prepared for Jesus' entry, they talked among themselves. Andrew may have said to Peter, Did you notice how angry Judas became when the woman anointed Jesus with the costly ointment? Yes, I did. Yes, I did, said another disciple. One disciple said, I saw Judas running off by himself. He was headed towards the temple complex. And why would he go there? Doesn't he know it's dangerous for us to be alone with him? Especially after John heard the priests plotting to kill Lazarus and Jesus? As the disciples were there at the table, eating and drinking, they were not expecting to hear the words that Jesus was about to say. Jesus turned to them and says, I tell you a truth before it happens, my friends. One of you will betray me. We cannot imagine the horror and the speculation that rose in these men. As Jesus says, He who dips his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Jesus continues to say, The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Judas says, Is it I, Rabbi? Jesus looked directly at Judas and says, You have said so. What you are going to do, do it quickly. Jesus spoke many things that night. And his words pierced the hearts of those present. And he would offer prayers to God with such fervency. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Jesus says to those that are present, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. At this moment, Jesus lifted his head and his hands toward heaven, and he took the bread and he broke it, 
and he gave to each of them, and he blessed it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as they drank, Jesus tells them, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. God's redemptive plan would be on full display in the coming days. And the prophetic words penned by Isaiah nearly 700 years prior to this night would be etched into the hearts and minds of those who were eyewitnesses of his suffering and the resurrection. The prophet Isaiah, by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would foretell in graphic detail the events that the disciples and the world would witness. Who has believed what he has heard of us? And to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? Surely has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced and wounded for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. When Jesus and his disciples finished the Passover, and Judas had gone to the high priest to betray him, as was his custom, Jesus led his friends to the Mount of Olives, to the garden called Gethsemane, which in the Aramaic means oil press, to pray. The significance of this place in time and space paints us a glorious picture of God's redemption plan. It was here the Son of God would be pressed even as the olives were pressed there to produce anointing oil, for his anointing would break every yoke. Three times Jesus would cry out, Father, if it be your will, remove this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, 
yours be done. So great was the love for you and I. Jesus said yes. The Son of God set his gaze on a prize. And his reward is you. For this purpose, Christ was made manifest in this earth to destroy the works of the devil. His yes was the cry of freedom. So we would experience freedom from fear, freedom from sin, freedom from bondage, freedom from death, hell, and the grave. King Jesus invites us all to come to his royal table as his friends, brethren, children, to eat and drink and taste and see that the Lord is good and that his mercy endures forever. He has redeemed our yes with every drop of holy blood that he sweated that night in the garden. Let us say yes today in remembrance of King Jesus. We say, yes, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. I want you to get your communion ready. Can you imagine how Jesus must have felt the night that he gathered with those disciples around that table? Tonight at one point we had the cast to freeze and I don't know if you noticed something, but we mimicked it, the famous portrait by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. Arguably one of the greatest artists of all time did his best to capture this night. But can you imagine what Jesus must have felt as he sat at this table, knowing what was to come. And to make it even worse, to have one of your best friends that you've just lived with, ate with, and walked with for three and a half years, to stab you in the back and go out and be the one to betray you and sell you into their hands. One of the most powerful passages of Scripture is in the gospel. Whenever Judas slammed the door, the Bible says, and he ran out to betray Jesus. Look at it in the gospel. Jesus turns to his disciples and starts encouraging them to forgive. Think about the pressure. I can tell you right now, I wouldn't handle the pressure that way. If it was me, I would have called for some angels to burn Judas's tail. Not Jesus. Jesus so loved the sinner that even when one of his best friends breaks his heart, his response is not to condemn, but to ask the other disciples to pray and forgive. That night, Jesus sat at a table for the last time on this planet with those men. Celebrating the holiest time of the year for a Jewish person, Passover. Passover did not begin at this table. It culminated at this table. Passover began 
thousands of years before this night. When in Egypt, the children of Israel had been in bondage for over 400 years. And finally, God raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses. And he tells Moses, my judgment is about to hit Egypt. And those ten plagues that were poured out were God trying to show Pharaoh that he's not king. And I want to tell you, my friend, I want you to hear me well because I never know who's watching me. I don't care what kind of title you have. You might be the setting president of the United States. I don't know who's watching me tonight. But I want to let you know tonight that there is nobody on this planet who has the ultimate authority. The Bible says the God who sits in the heavens laughs. There's only one God who is in control of heaven and earth. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so God poured out plagues on Egypt, 10 judgments. And the 10th one, interesting enough, God told Moses, there's only one way for you to escape this. Because my judgment is going to pass through Egypt and when it does, every firstborn in every house is going to die. Listen to me carefully. The only way that you can get by this judgment and live is go find you a spotless lamb without any blemish. Take it into your house. Become acquainted with that lamb. Inspect that lamb. Make sure that it's pure. And then what you're to do is you're to take that lamb and you're to slay it. And I want you to come home and I want you to take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost and the lintel of your house. And when judgment passes over Egypt, I love this right here. Everywhere that I see the blood... Judgment will not hit that house, but grace and mercy can be found residing in that home. Everywhere that I see the blood. Come on, say that with me. Everywhere that I see the blood. Moses really did not have any idea that what he was doing that night wasn't just about that night. He really did not know that the blood applied to the doorpost was a shadow of something far greater to come. And that for the next 3,500 years, man would do the best that he could every year at the same time of the year to celebrate Passover around a table. And every time they would gather around that table, the prophet Jeremiah says, they would tell the story of how God brought them out of Egypt and delivered them from bondage. But Moses had no clue that the blood applied to the doorpost and the lintel really wasn't just about Egypt. That all of the lambs that would be sacrificed every year at Passover and as they sat around the table, it wasn't just about Egypt. It was pointing to something far greater. It was pointing to the spotless Lamb of God in whom there is no blemish at all. The Bible says He was here, but He was without sin. He was so holy that at the end of His life, the devil came to find something in Him and the Bible records He could not find anything in our Jesus. He's the sinless, spotless, holy Lamb of God. He was the only one qualified to die for the sins of the whole world. Everybody else was inadequate. Nobody could pay the sin debt but him. So that night when he sat at this table and he tells them, this is my body 
that's about to be broken for you. He knew it had nothing to do with bread. He knew that he was fulfilling thousands of years of prophecy as the lamb who had been slain from before the foundation of the world. You better listen to this preacher tonight. The cross is not God's knee-jerk reaction to the sin that entered the world. The cross was God's plan before sin ever entered the world. It's an eternal plan. And all of these sacrifices that were made from Egypt forward were nothing but just types and shadows of something far greater. When the Lamb of God would be ripped apart on a mean beam called the cross. When the Lamb of God would have His blood poured out on that cross. Jesus knew it. Nobody else knew it. Not even the devils of hell themselves knew it. For the Bible declares, had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. They had no clue that him hanging upon the cross was the mystery hidden from before the foundation of the world as the Apostle Paul declares. God concealed a secret. Gave mankind 4,000 years of hints. Every year they sat around the table, it was a hint that there was a secret that had been concealed for 4,000 years. And tonight, when Jesus stood at that table on that Passover night, it was unlike all the other nights because now they weren't just talking about a lamb that had been slain. They were talking about the lamb. Somebody say the lamb. The lamb who would take away the sins of the whole world. Now I want to tell you something tonight that some of you might not know. The first place that Jesus shed his blood was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says his sweat became as great drops of blood. Do you know why that is? Because there was so much pressure and stress on our Lord that his body couldn't take it anymore. And as he sweat, his capillaries under his skin began to burst. And pour forth blood. When Satan came into the garden to try to get him to stop what he was doing, he didn't know. You just put, in, put a little more pressure. Just put a little more pressure. I'm in Gethsemane. I'm in the olive press. I need you to press me just a little more. Just a little more pressure. If you'll press just a little more and all of a sudden here comes one drop of blood. Satan didn't think anything about it. Until it fell off of that Galilean's beard and hit the ground. And something shifted in the earth. Then Jesus took nails in his hand. Then in his feet, a spear in his side, a crown of thorns upon his head. The Bible records Jesus shed blood in seven places. His sweat... His hands, his feet, his side, his head, the crown. That's six. But I told you he bled seven places. Listen to what Isaiah says about this moment. He was wounded for our transgressions. A transgression is something that happens on the outside. It's a transgression. So the reason Jesus was wounded and shed blood on the outside was for our transgression. But listen to what the Word of God says. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
He didn't just bleed on the outside of his body. When Jesus took the punishment on the cross, he bled on the inside of his body. Now, why is that? Because a transgression is an outward act, but an iniquity is a bondage that keeps pulling you back into that bondage. And the Bible says Jesus shed blood in all seven places so my hands would be right, the living right, my walk would be right, my heart would be right, my thinking would be right, carrying pressure and pain would be right. But I like this part right here. But what about the brokenhearted? What about those who've been abused and you're emotionally damaged? What about those of you who have went through tragedy of divorce and you don't know how to overcome it? What about those of you who might have, have, have went through an encounter in life and it so scarred you that there's something emotionally broken in you? Here's the good news. Jesus died for the whole man, body, soul, and spirit. And here's what Jesus was basically telling his disciples. I'm going to go to that cross. And I'm going to put my blood on that beam. And everybody who will apply my blood to the doorpost of their life will be forgiven of their sin, healed of their disease, delivered from their bondage, broken hearts mended, emotions put back together. Folks, I want to tell you, what Jesus did this week at the cross for us, nobody else and nothing else could do for us. Only the blood of Jesus can rebuke the devourer from taking our life. And then he makes this wonderful statement. If you believe. All you got to do is believe. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to go through a lot of calisthenics. All you got to do is believe in your heart that I died on that cross for you. And then say it with your mouth. And if you do that, I'll take my blood and I'll put it upon the doorpost of your life. And it doesn't matter what you've done or where you come from or what your background is. It doesn't matter the sin that you committed. I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to ball it up. I'm going to throw it as far as the east is from the west. And I'll never remember it against you anymore. And then I'm going to take a pen and I'm going to write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And you'll be assured of heaven as if you're already there. And one day, whether you go by death or go by resurrection I want you to know something I'm going to prepare a place for you and if I go I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where you are where I am there you may be also and we can forever be with the Lord so tonight I don't have to fear a death angel because if I die I win if I live I win because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Say it with me. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. I 
psalmist describes it this way. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. The full embodiment of truth and mercy, righteousness, and peace. Only the blood of Jesus saves. Hear me tonight. There are not many paths to heaven. Jesus said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. And no man will come to the Father except through me. No other religion. I don't care what the progressives say. I don't care what the liberals are spouting. No other way to heaven. No other way to relationship with God except through the man Jesus Christ. For there is one mediator between God and man. The Bible says the man Christ Jesus. He's the only way. What can wash away my sin? Sing it loud. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on, loud now. Oh. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take your bread. This is his body that has been broken for you. As often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of him. How he was torn apart so that you could be put back together. How that the backside of our Lord was ripped apart with the cat of 39, 39 uh, lashes with the cat of nine tails. And the Bible says he did it for the healing of your disease. He didn't have to take the abuse. They spit on him. They mocked him. They ripped his beard out. They put a crown on his head. They beat him. Could have stopped it at any moment. But he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And as often as you eat this, remember what I did. Thank you for your body, Lord. Thank you for enduring our punishment. We should have been there, not you. We deserve it, not you. Tonight, we remember what you did for us. In Jesus' name, let's partake. I want you to take the cup.
Lord, the blood that your body contained was the only holy blood on this planet, untainted by fallen man. We understand that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. I don't really comprehend all of that, Lord, but it's how you designed it. That without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Your word says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. There's power in your blood. This blood not only forgives us, but when we partake, it makes us the righteousness of God in Christ. Our best day for you is nothing but a filthy rag. But Lord, our worst day with you, we're still the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So Lord, tonight, we remember your blood that was shed for us. For our redemption. Thank you. Thank you. For forgiving us of our sin. And cleansing us from all of our unrighteousness. In Jesus' name. Let's partake of this cup together. I'm going to ask you to stand all over this room. They're going to ease the house lights up just enough for me to see right now. I want every head bowed in this room for just a moment. Nobody moving for just a moment. If you're in here today and you say, Pastor, I'll be honest with you. I'm not right with Jesus. I'm not right with Jesus. If I were to die right now, I'm not so sure I'd make it to heaven. But I want to be right with the Lord. There's a lot of churches all over America. They no longer give an altar call. I believe in giving an altar call. Because I believe lives are changed in an altar. A lot of churches say, well, you're going to scare people by putting them on the spot. Let me tell you, if this scares you, I don't know what to do for you because I'm talking about giving you life everlasting. If you're in here tonight and you say, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, I'm not right with Jesus. Or maybe you used to serve the Lord, but you've, you've backslid, you've went away from God like the prodigal son. But you say, Pastor, I'm not right with Jesus. I want the privilege of praying with you right now. And this is a wonderful season to give it to Christ. If you're in here right now, you say, Pastor, I'm not right with the Lord. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to lift your hand. You say, well, why are you going to ask me to lift my hand? Because here's what I believe. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before me, and I'll acknowledge you before the Father. I believe when your hand goes up, I believe something happens in the heavens on your behalf. Number two... Faith without works is dead, being alone. It's not enough just to believe. The devils believe. Faith without works is dead. So this is an action that is saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for my sins, and He wants to make me right tonight. When you lift that hand in just a moment... What you're basically saying is, I don't care what anybody else thinks around me. I'm not here for them. Here's what I care about. I care that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I care that I'm born again. If you're in here tonight and you say, Pastor, I'm not right with Jesus, but tonight I want to make it right with Him. I know tonight He loves me. He loves me. And he died for me. I want to make it right with him. If that's you, I want you right now in the name of Jesus, slip up your hand. Slip up your hand. I want to pray with you. Slip up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand over there and that one. 
Who else? Say, Pastor, I'm not right with the Lord, but I want to get right tonight. Tonight. God bless you. God bless you, young man. God bless you, young lady. I see that hand. Listen, don't miss your your moment. This is a great moment in God right now. God is reaching and snatching people out of the kingdom of darkness and transferring them into the kingdom of His dear Son right now. So I'm going to ask one more time. Is there anybody else in here that says, hey, I want to get in on this prayer right now. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Lift your hand. Let me see it. All right. If you lifted your hand or you didn't and you know you should have, look right here. Here's how easy this is. We call upon the name of the Lord. You shall be saved. How easy is that? We call upon the name of the Lord. You shall be saved. It's that easy. He loves you. He's already done all the work for you. You don't have to work for this. All you got to do is believe for it. Amen. Everybody shout believe. Believe. All you got to do is believe for it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray with you as a congregation. And, And if you lifted your hand or you didn't and you know you should have, I want you to pray this from right here, not from here. Pray it from right here. And pray it out loud with us. We're going to pray with you, okay? Amen. Y'all ready, congregation? Everybody say this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you arose from the grave. So tonight, I give you my life. I surrender to you. And I confess with my mouth. I believe with my heart that Jesus is Lord. Come on now, say that out loud. Jesus is Lord. One more time. Jesus is Lord. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, here's what I believe. I believe that God just changed your whole life, and we want to welcome you into the family of God. Amen? We want to welcome you into the family of God. The greatest decision you've ever made is to serve Jesus. Everything else is easier after that. Serving Jesus is everything. Amen? Amen. And we want you to know here at the church, we're for you and not against you. Now, if you just prayed that prayer and you haven't been water baptized this coming Sunday, we want to baptize you in water and make a public profession of your faith. Come on, somebody. Listen, everybody else is coming out of the closet. You might as well quit hiding your Christian witness as well. It's time to make a profession of faith. Amen. I want to do something real quick. I want to say thank you to Steve Williams, Noah, and the media team, and all of these guys who came up here all day yesterday and worked on this stuff. They did it all for you just so you know that Jesus is real. Everybody say Wednesday night. We've been talking about the eclipses. Thursday night. Ah, Sorry, I'm sorry. It's it's 35 years ingrained into me. Thursday night. We've been talking about the eclipses. If you have not listened to any of those messages, go online. Please listen to those messages. But this Thursday night, we're going back into prophecy even deeper again. I'm going to give you a little indication. This Thursday night, I'm going to tell you what's going on with Russia. This coming Thursday night. So don't miss it. Amen. All right. Everybody love Jesus in this room. All right. Get out of here. Go have a great week in the Lord. We love you. We will see you later. Visitors, make sure you come and get your free gift.